Uh, kia ora tato, everybody. Bruce Harrell's my name, and I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit. So welcome to this pivot to Omicron. A good day to be talking about this because uh, you will have all heard that the borders will be opening up over the next uh, few, uh, many months until fully opened in October this year. So, and I think we all know Omicron's here and um, some of you will be having to deal with it already, but we're going to have a lot, uh, a lot on our plate. Um, so you can see there that the topic we've got tonight, we've got two speakers from New South Wales and Australia who kindly agreed to join us. Uh, we've had two and a half thousand people register for tonight, so clearly a topic of huge interest. And I'd just like to hand over to uh, Dr. Stuart Jenkins, who's uh, a GP on the North Shore, but Clinical Director of Primary Care at Auckland and Waitematā District Health Boards, who helped put the program together tonight. So Stuart, over to you. Tēnā katoa katoa. I'd just like to um, say a, a very brief introduction around um, what we are facing with the Omicron outbreak. Um, and, and really to encourage that we learn from each other as, as clinicians, not be afraid to improvise um, and adapt to achieve change. The purpose of tonight, um, tonight's webinar is to provide, I guess, enabling advice for you to help you make decisions for your individual situations, just acknowledging that you've all got different things, you know, in terms of practice sizes and different mixes. Um, we hope this is going to be useful information for you. And the, my last um, comment is really to remind you of health pathways. It's all there. If there's something there that we, we go through and you can't remember it or you just want to double check it, go to health pathways. And that's where we provide all the information on the COVID response. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so my great pleasure now to introduce uh, Dr. Gary Jackson, who's a public health physician and the Director of Population Health at Counties Manukau, who's going to talk to us about the modelling and what's, uh, what's anticipated. Gary. I'm just going to just run through quickly the, the volumes that we're kind of expecting in this current outbreak and, and a little bit of a view forward. So we've, we've We've had the advantage in New Zealand of looking at some of the other countries and how they've, they've uh, how, how the Omicron has gone in their countries. There's still a lot of um, uncertainty around some of the parameters and particularly how they react in the New Zealand setting. But um, Te Punaha Matatini have done a, a brave job and they've, they've done a prediction for each DHB, a projection. Um, so that projection is available through Central TAS. So each DHB you'll have access to projections that are based on their population their, by age, by ethnicity, and by their vaccine state, current vaccine status, and a projected vaccine status. So for their low projections, they're estimated that New Zealand will get up to about 12,000 cases a day um, spread across the, the different um, vaccinated populations. If I take that and, and turn it into um, what we're expecting in the northern region, so this is the three Auckland DHBs plus Northland, um, just showing the difference in, in, in the scenario, so a low transmission scenario versus a medium transmission scenario. The way that uh, TPM described this, they, they described low transmission as being something like South Australia, um, a, a jurisdiction that's done quite well. Medium transmission is something more like New South Wales or London in terms of much higher case, case rates. So we're actually aiming for, for the lower transmission lot. Um, it, at, based on those projections, the northern region would get up to about 4,000 cases a day, which is about 20 times what we saw in Delta. So if you'd imagine the little livid at the bottom, and you can see a little disturbance at the bottom of my graph, that would be that, around about the 200 mark about where, where we were with Delta. So it's a significant step up in terms of the number of cases that we're expecting. If I zoom in on that, so there's, there's my 200 line Inside of seeing that graph, that's where Delta got to. We're halfway there already with the current uh, cases in the northern region. And you can kind of see where Omicron started. There's a sudden jump up in activity. We're almost beaten Delta. It was um, very, very low, low rates. And that's probably very positive because we, we're, we're um, starting from a very low base. 
But of course, it's very early days yet, so we'll wait and see what happens there. If I turn to the hospital beds, the other thing that the modeling does is tries to estimate the, the occupancy in hospital. This is a bit harder because we're at, the, at the moment we're using the lengths of stay that we saw in Delta, but it's likely that Omicron's gonna have a shorter length of stay. So, so what's shown here is probably on the high side, but this would be estimating that, we'd, that the Northern region would get up to about 400 occupied beds by the sort of mid to late March. Um, that, that's about, we've got about 90 in Delta. So that would be kind of four times uh, what we saw then. Um, I think it may be slightly too high in the model, but that's the good thing about models that um, you want them, uh, you don't want them to come true, you want to work to, to disprove them. So, so that's part of the art of modeling is they, they should always be wrong because you should always react and change the, the mode. The other thing to note about this diagram is that you're expecting quite low ICU um, uh, cases. Omicron stays largely in the upper respiratory tract, less likely to cause um, intensive care admissions. Still can, and particularly for the unvaccinated, still quite a large risk, but um, much lower volumes than we saw with Delta are expected. Um, and there's just a, a zoomed in a close up of where we are. The hospitals are as quiet as they've been since since um, August with with uh, the last outbreak. So again, a very good base for the hospitals to be um, taking off from. And that's me. Uh, thanks, Gary. Our next speaker is uh, Tim Cutfield. Uh, Tim is an infectious disease uh, consultant at um, Middlemore Hospitals. So he's going to talk about uh, what he's seeing at his end. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Gary. Look, I'm just going to give a, a couple of really high level um, clinical perspectives, I guess, with Omicron. And um, it's, it's based on what little data we have already, right? We'll learn more as the months come past and, uh, you know, in, um, uh, in journals. But uh, what we can say is that Omicron is SARS-CoV-2, it's a virus, but it's, um, it's a really mutated version of that virus. And uh, you can see here a diagram of a number of the mutations in the spike protein, which facilitates entry into the into the host cell. Um, and these these mutations are going to do all sorts of things. Um, and what we've seen by Gary's modelling is how hyper transmissible this variant is compared to previous variants that we've seen. And it's probably through a couple of different um, mechanisms. Uh, some uh, intrinsically uh, more infectious about it um, and there are a number of different ways that we could look at that and some science coming out about that but I think probably the biggest thing is its ability to evade the immune uh, protection that was offered by previous infection with SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, or vaccination um, and this is quite eloquently demonstrated by um, this little table uh, I'm just, I can't can't use my pointer. Um, so you just have to look at that um, but uh, it was comparing households in Denmark uh, who were either infected with Delta or with Omicron and looking at the risk of in-household transmission and by vaccination status. And you can see actually for an unvaccinated um, household, there's actually not much difference. In fact, um, virtually no difference in the rate of transmissibility within a household. Um, but when you're looking at a vaccinated household, it's significantly more transmission uh, with Omicron. So uh, demonstrating its ability to beat the immune protection. Um, now we're talking about Omicron as, as a, a, a viral variant. There are sub-variants around and people will have heard of BA2 and BA1. BA2 probably is a little bit more um, catchy, uh, but we're going to just consider Omicron as the sin and, and the syndrome that it causes uh, tonight. Um, the silver lining, I guess, in its hypertransmissible state is that it is less severe than the Delta variant um, as, as a result of some of those mutations. And Gary's already touched on this. Um, you've, you've more than half it's likely to end up in hospital with this coming from lots of different sources and probably 90% likely to end, it's likely to end up in ICU or die uh, compared to previous variants. And um, Gary's modeled that um, data for what it might look like here. And uh, I've shown some screenshots of uh, data that's come out of the States very, very recently um, with uh, squiggly lines demonstrating the rates of cases on the bottom, on bottom left uh, of Omicron per 100,000 population with the solid line being unvaccinated and the dashed lines are two vaccinated and then um, boosted. And you can see that while there was a hump of Delta and then a big hump of deaths, which is the, um, the uh, graph to the, to the right of it, um, while there's a, it's very different for Omicron, right? There's a huge surge of cases they've seen in the States and a high proportion of those being vaccinated, but only a small uptick in the deaths and almost all of those, in fact, all of those really are in the unvaccinated population. Uh, with the vaccinated being a flat line at the bottom and a similar thing for hospitalization. 
in terms of how these people are going to rock up to your practice and um, what are they going to look like compared to people with Delta. Um, this is some data from the UK, which suggests that while actually the symptoms might be pretty similar for people presenting um, early on, at least in their illness, um, much more likely to have a sore throat and far less likely to have loss of sense of taste or smell, but otherwise similar in terms of fever, cough and some of the other common symptoms. Um, so overall, no major difference in the types of symptoms, um, but this is uh, another data set from Zoe, self-reported symptoms in the UK, 3 million people who punch in what they've got when they get their positive test. And you can see those top five symptoms that people are reporting, right? runny nose, headache, any fatigue, sneezing, sore throat. I mean, these are upper respiratory tract infection symptoms, right? With the cardinal three of cough, fever, and anosmia being seen in less than 50% of people based on this data. Um, another interesting line of evidence that, you know, with previous variants, maybe up to 50% of people uh, may have been asymptomatic. I say 50% of cases or infections were asymptomatic, and that number might be as high as 90% of Omicron cases are asymptomatic in a vaccinated population, um, which I guess tells the story of these people will be turning up to your office with upper respiratory tract symptoms, non-specific symptoms, and many of them won't have any symptoms at all, and you'll be seeing them for something completely different, but they'll have Omicron. Um, so that was my summary, summary points, I guess, without going too deep. Very, very transmissible, mainly through getting around the immune defences. Um, it does cause severe illness, but far less frequently uh, than Delta, uh, and particularly in vaccinated cohorts. These are non-specific well people, and I think it, a summary line is there at the bottom. You know, the vast majority of cases in New Zealand will be well when you see them and will do well. And that's all I've got to say. Just got a question for you. So for people, um, my understanding is there's less chest signs and breathlessness with Omicron. So what do people end up in hospital with? What takes them, do they get the chest problems or what, what, what drives them to hospital? Uh, good question. Um, can't find any really granular data on that. I think it's, this is still SARS-CoV-2, right? And so there will be some people who end up with typical pneumonitis, just a much lower proportion. Um, the hospitalization data is tricky because people are gonna turn up with hospital for other reasons and also have Omicron on the basis of the prevalence in the community. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't able to find any clear data on that, but it's still COVID-19, just a milder version as far as I'm aware. Okay, well, we're running very nicely on time. Um, so we've now got, um, uh, Louise Delaney, who's the National Clinical Advisor, uh, Health Pathways, uh, and a former GP from New South Wales. So, Louise, and thank you very much for spending your late afternoon with us. Thanks very much for having me. So, yeah, I'm Louise. I'm a GP in the Illawarra region, which is just south of Sydney in New South Wales on the coast. Um, and I also work as a clinical advisor with Health Pathways for Australia and New Zealand. Um, so I thought rather than giving you the grandmotherly platitudes that it's going to be better, don't worry as much because it's better than Delta, I thought I'd actually give you some whoops, some of the um, data from New South Wales to start with. So our population in New South Wales is 8.2 million. And since the start of the COVID pandemic, we've had 1.09 million cases all up. About 80,000 of those cases happened before December 21, and about a million cases have happened since December 21. Um, prior to December, it was mostly Delta, and since then, it's been mostly Omicron. And um, our total deaths of the pandemic have been 1,400. Just under half of those are in the first 80,000 cases, and the other half have happened in the latter million cases. So our death rate with Delta was in the you know, order of seven per thousand cases and our death rate with Omicron is in the order of seven per 10,000 cases. Um, so significant difference, presumably mostly due to the fact that it's Omicron, but also obviously we've now got a much more immunized population as well, who whilst Omicron doesn't, isn't as protective, sorry, whilst vaccination isn't as protective against Omicron, it's certainly still highly effective against severe disease. Um, Currently, yesterday, our active cases currently were 119,000, and of those, two per 100 people needed hospitalisation and six per 10,000 need ventilation. So, you know, clearly a much better picture. Um, our vaccination situation at the moment is, you know, we've got 94% of people, 94% of adults currently have had two vaccines, two vaccine doses, 40% of adults have now had 
So 40% of adults have now had uh, a booster. Um, we've only just started immunising the five to 11 year olds in January. So we're only up to 40% first dose with them. Sorry. So trying to distill the last couple of intense months down into a very quick result. Um, the main value that I've found out of this whole experience is collaborate where possible is the, the main message. So obviously a lot of us are tired and burnt out right now and um, trying to have the energy for another surge of cases is, is really challenging. And throughout history and especially you know, recently, we've had huge system silos between hospital systems and primary care. Any opportunity we can have as GPs to collaborate, make the most of those opportunities. So collaboration with our colleagues and also collaboration upwards with the health system if we possibly can. So in <clears throat> New South Wales, we've had, we have a wonderful president of the college for New South Wales and she set up a base camp group for GP leaders. We have also shared that base camp across our network. So a lot of people have access to direct lines of communication where we can share resources, we can share issues. We have a very strong solution focused frame of thinking so that we can come up with solutions and have direct communication upwards to ministry level, which has been fantastic. It's the first time <coughs> New South Wales Health has really had to rely on the GP perspective and rely on GPs as workforce. And they've found this a really positive experience of collaboration. So we've had GP representation in their meetings. We've also had Health Pathways as well, which has meant you know, great relationships across those traditional silos and abilities to communicate. As the numbers have increased rapidly, there's been rapid changes in model of care over you know, a week to two week time frame. And the way that we've dealt with those has been you know, similar to this, having webinars at state level, but also at local level. If you've got GP colleagues and specialist colleagues who are involved in care of COVID, it can be fantastic for trust and relationships and confidence to be running very frequent webinars as your numbers go up. Um, it just reduces the stress at the front line. And again, <clears throat> having health pathways GPs involved in the model of care changes means that we can communicate very rapidly to the front line. Certainly we've seen lots of evidence of powerless and unhappiness, powerlessness and unhappiness on the front lines. There's been the usual sort of disaster thinking that you see sometimes where you get outrage and you get outrage at leadership and you also get outrage across the health sector at different components. So certainly, We've seen unhappiness between emergency and general practice and vice versa. Um, and it's important to recognise that in this situation where you have overwhelming numbers that we're all in this together and to really exhibit compassion and empathy towards other people in the health sector, health sector who are all working under that level of stress. Um, ACI, Agency for Clinical Innovation New South Wales, did start a website called the Pandemic Kindness Movement and that's got great resources that clinicians have pulled together that are really good to have a look at. Um, but really trying to convert from whinging and complaining into solution focused thinking is a really positive approach to take. And similarly in your practice at a smaller level, taking that disaster type framework response where you care for your team as a first priority and really try and organize your team's approach. You know, it might include daily huddles, it might include really working to enable as many possible people with mild symptoms to self-assess and self-manage, which will be through your website patient information, potentially having reception standard scripts so that your receptionist can help people, really making sure that you're making available space for those people who really need access to you in terms of equity or severity of illness to actually be able to get to you. But still remembering that with Omicron, the vast majority will do well and even our experience has been that high-risk patients still are doing very well. And then using your health pathways for your clinical knowledge and also knowing your local escalation pathways and contact phone numbers. And I'll hand over to Wally, who's got more frontline experience in Western Sydney than me from here. Uh, thank you, um, Louise. That, that, that's great. I love the pandemic kindness movement. I think uh, we, sh we should uh, have a little meeting at the end of this and... Uh, 
I didn't know it was a huddle or a cuddle you said, but I like. I think uh, either would, a huddle. Either, either would be nice, wouldn't they? So, uh, you can also uh, so the also occasional can. cuddle would help. Uh, so I'd just like to introduce uh, Wali Jamal. He's a GP in Western Sydney and a GP advisor for New South Wales, uh, New South Wales Agency for Clinical Innovation. Wali. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for having us. Thanks, Louise. Um, look, I'll just quickly um, chat about um, our personal experience. I'm a GP in Western Sydney. We've obviously um, wear a number of hats, but very much been involved with looking after patients with COVID, not just with the Omicron way, but before that over the last sort of 18 months or so. We've been sort of experimenting with a few models directly with the kids' hospital as well as other the adult hospital over the last 18 months. But really, um, when Omicron hit, it really had to, you know, the rubber did hit the road, so to speak, and we really had to get organised. Um, as Louise you know, said, the numbers were um, simply outstanding, uh, you know, incredible. But look, if I can just pass on a, a number of key messages from, as a GP, how do you look after these patients and how do you do it at home and what, what sort of things you need to consider? For us, it was, we saw it as an opportunity to really you know, develop a model that's really, what you know, to borrow some words I've heard from a Canadian, primary care inspired with this institutional backing. And that's what um, Louise was talking about when we were talking about integration of care and integration of advice between both general practice and the um, hospital sector. Um, so we're all in this together and having to look after these patients together. Um, as has been said already, um, thankfully, Omicron in a vaccinated population, especially, but even if, uh, particularly, even if their patient's high risk, is a mild illness and it is just another respiratory illness. Do not be afraid. It's well within the scope of your expertise as GPs and primary care physicians. Um, but um, nevertheless, um, you need to do a few things to get ready um, in, in terms of our experience and in terms of our practice. And the first was to actually provide a hell of a lot of support for. Um, uh, the administrative staff and, and develop a triage protocol at your practices. As Louise said, educating patients to try and look after themselves at home, because at the end of the day, the vast majority of them, and I do mean 80% at least, have minimal or mild symptoms uh, or no symptoms. Um, and you don't want to take every single call and, to, and pass it on to a clinician if, if you don't have to, um, if there's a simple question and answer that you can provide. Um, you know, you've got to um, familiarise yourself with clinical factors and, and care integration factors and, and be able to sort of develop, have some sort of system in your practices and your regions for clinical support of general practice when you run into trouble. You know, how do you escalate care? How do you hand over care to the LHD? How do you um, get patients help um, at home? Because the vast 99, I would say probably over 99.5% of care that we provide in general practice to these patients is via telehealth, preferably video, but um, sometimes phone. Um, and as I already said, so developing systems around self-management, putting information on your website, but having um, email fact sheets to provide, having links to provide to patients, all to provide that reassurance. And of course, this is an opportunity to really develop team-based care in your practices, not necessarily having the GP having to do everything um, and getting the whole team, everyone from both reception, your nursing staff, administrative staff, allied health staff involved uh, wherever possible. Next slide, please, Louise. In terms of a sort of a, a framework that we developed in our practice, um, this, I won't go through every single point, but, but as Louise said, get looking after each other, huddles, cuddles, whatever you want to do in your practices to make sure, because when you're having, having lots and lots and lots and lots of calls, um, you know, it does get actually quite stressful. Everybody's under the pump. Um, educating yourself with health pathways and knowing where to look for resources, knowing where to find the guidelines. Oh, I'm not going to go through the clinical guidelines. Um, as I've said, don't be afraid. Um, it is a mild illness. This is another respiratory illness and the vast majority of patients do very well. Um, triage, clinical assessment. Um, and in terms of clinical assessment, when, the, you know, calls do come through to clinicians, it's about you know, recognising red flags. It's about safety netting. It's about doing a risk assessment, working out how risk, what risk this patient with their comorbidities has for deterioration. Do they need other support? Do they need oximetry at home, which also can guide? And the proportion of patients that need this with Omicron is, are very, is very small, mind you. Um, are, they, are they and do they qualify for your local health criteria for disease-modifying drugs, such as citrupamab, how are you going to organise that? Um, 
Otherwise you treat it, as I said, like any other viral illness. When you exclude the red flags, the risk and comorbidities, the disease modifying trough, you, you've, you're left with a mild illness. Um, and so think about what the patient wants to know. What can I expect? How sick am I going to get? Who do I call when I get into trouble? Um, and uh, how, where can I find my information? When can I leave isolation? Am I still infectious afterwards? So there's a whole lot of developing fact sheets and developing um, answers to those questions uh, and, mod and, and building that on scale, I think is really important to be able to cope with the numbers that you expected. Um, advice on self-management, um, escalation uh, to the to specialist care when necessary and advice on the isolation as I've already said. So um, having that in, I mean, we've at all those points I've developed, you know, in our practice, we found it useful to develop a living protocol, which we changed and tested and everybody from reception across all the GPs um, have input into this protocol and, 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 and having links within this protocol so that the information is at the tip of your fingers so you're not wasting time. Um, monitoring patients at home. I mean, if you can use technology with remote monitoring devices, um, having fact uh, questionnaires and symptom checkers that they can do or in an automated fashion. If, if you have that technology, if you're able to integrate that into your systems, that's even better because at the end of the day, we're gonna to have to monitor, or we are monitoring lots of patients, although they're monitoring themselves, we sometimes have to get involved and doing it at scale is really important. Happy to take questions later on. Uh, thank you very much, Wiley. It sounds like um, you've got your systems all in place there. Um, our next speaker is Pauline Hurrell. She's clinical lead uh, COVID-19 care in the community. Um, uh, health system preparedness program from the ministry. Pauline. Kia ora koutou, kato. I'll just share my screen. So um, I, I feel it's that the order of speakers has been quite fortuitous for me because I know that the Australian colleagues have been extremely helpful in, in sharing their experience as the uh, New Zealand ministry COVID care in the community team sort of tried to understand what a what an Omicron pivot would mean for us here in New Zealand. And look, there are many, many uncertainties still as to how this will play out. Uh, but I just wanted to present you an overview of where uh, how we've translated in this the the ministry. COVID care in the community team uh, and what that would look like for the self-management. Um, in, in essence, it's kind of um, in response to, to three main things. Uh, conveniently, Gary already uh, introduced us to the fact that we're going to expect many, many cases that, that will be just simply impossible for us to individually case manage. Uh, secondly, and equally conveniently, Tim outlined some of the specificities about the um, Omicron variant itself and its higher transmissibility, but mild disease pattern. But thirdly, the most important thing that I think is kind of governing our um, current thinking about self-management is the equity focus. We, we really need to be able to enable and empower those who can and are able to self-manage at home to do so, so we can really optimize our resources and our, and our personal energy, to be honest, um, and our collaborative energy to care for those who most need the care. So just as a reminder, you can see up on the screen there that the, um, the government has outlined a three-phase response to Omicron, and you can see there, there's a little we are here icon. Um, obviously, what we're looking at tonight is um, a plan to roll out irrespective of what, fa of what phase we're in. Um, however, you can probably all expect that at some point we're going to move into phase three and probably quite quickly. So I just wanted to highlight there the three major points in, in bold under the phase three is the uh, progressive shift uh, and rollout of a, a whole range of automated tools that will, will support self-management uh, to happen. Uh, the clinical care focusing on those with the highest needs, but we maintain that really strong wraparound health and welfare support. Um, and as Louise and Wahil had correctly pointed out, that collaboration across sectors is extremely important. Just moving to my next slide. Um, yeah, so this is just to highlight that um, we, you know, we we do expect most people to be able to safely 
properly managed at home. And there are some things about our Omicron pivot which, which aren't different. Um, that sort of yellow hatched area in the middle there you can see is all the work that's been done to date already in the regions around establishment of community care hubs um, and all of the, the, the strong connections and, and coordinations that are happening already around a, a patient in Fano who may find themselves um, unwell with the COVID-19 virus. Um, what, we, what we were doing now, I mean, the whole model, the premise of the whole model is that it's sort of centrally led, but regionally coordinated and, and locally led. What we're doing now is at central level is we're really uh, developing at pace, quickly as possible, the tools and the processes to try and automate as much of the self-management as possible. So um, whilst we will be focusing a lot on the health Care for this particular presentation tonight. It's just an acknowledgement that we think that the, the welfare needs are probably going to be one of the biggest challenges for many people who find themselves unwell or simply not that unwell, but having to be isolating at home with their whanau. So um, there's a really strong um, coordination going on with MSD and all of their welfare sector uh, colleagues nationally and locally, uh, which I'm not talking about, but I just wanted to make sure that that's not because they're not extremely important in the success of this, this model. So here's what it kind of will look like in a sort of a pathway perspective. Um, there will be many questions I know about um, the details in here. Uh, what I wanted to try and do in the interest of time is break this down a little bit. And um, I myself, who's fairly new to the ministry, but a GP myself, have, have tried to sort of put this into four, three or four main steps. So first of all, on the bottom left, you can see that at, at the present time, uh, a patient will um, get a test of, it, of any sort. And at the point of that, patient having a positive test, there'll be a case created in the national contact tracing system and simultaneously into the COVID clinical care uh, module, which used to be called the BCMS. Both the patient and the GP will be notified by different uh, pathways that you can see there. What will happen then is that everybody who has the, the text or the digital um, capacity will be sent a text notification with some instructions on that about how to self-care, where to go for some information, and also a, um, a self-serve, if you like, form for them to log in and actually fill in a few more details for themselves. What you'll see that's quite um, interesting, perhaps up the top there, is this population risk score. So this is kind of um, one of the first of many places in the patient journey, journey where we are assessing and reassessing across the illness journey whether the person has got the right level of support or whether they need more support or actually they're doing fine. The population risk score I'll touch on very briefly but this is basically a, uh, a score that's based on age, ethnicity and COVID vaccination status which helps us to sort of allocate or to sort people at the point of a positive test to, to, to sort of know or to prioritize those that are going to need more help, some assisted support with telehealth um, being the, the main means of assessing that, or if we think that they'll be fine doing a self-serve or a self-management type approach. It's just an initial assessment. What's very important is that next step where the score or the priority rating, if you like, can be modified by a triage, a triage for, for symptoms, for severity of symptoms and any underlying risk factors, whether that be medical or social. At that point there, the patient and the whānau, if it's in a household bubble, can then be determined into either a uh, fully self-management pathway with, of course, all those resources and symptom checkers that uh, Waleed was talking about, or it's determined that that person really does need a bit more of a hands-on care. And it won't be too prescriptive there, it will be according to the need. What you can see is the little uh, stethoscopes across this graphic here. Those are the points at which the primary care teams or the GPs and nurses and all your primary care teams may or may not be involved in any part of this process. It will depend very much on what your local COVID hub has um, organised for you and the capacity of different practices in different regions. 
What's also going to tie this all together is um, the uh, COVID clinical care module. So this is um, a, I should be on the next slide. So this is now being rolled out and there'll be a whole series of uh, training webinars next week, plus um, information packets and instructions going out to you. It should be alive, it should be live already in most of your PMS through an, a health link tab. So you're welcome to go in there now and, and have a look at it. Um, you may or may not have patients sitting there already, or it might be some test patients. But the beauty of this uh, CCM, of course, is that um, it's going to be uh, for all COVID patients who are, have a case entered into the system. The system can then be viewed across that collaborative health network, whether it be your COVID hub, your practice staff, um, your ambulance staff, your DHB staff. So in essence, it's this is the glue that's going to help us to keep patients safe throughout their journey if they were to escalate uh, after hours or on the weekend or reach out for care. Everybody can see the patient journey throughout that throughout that time. Um, it's a fairly whiz bang uh, tour through this. The um, the importance of this is, of course, how to translate the healthcare part, if you like, uh, into the health pathways, which which is a process that, that we're, we're doing now so that um, it will be available for everybody to read and, and, um, and utilize. Um, and, and just to reiterate, even though there could be some um, sort of questions, very technical questions, which I probably won't be able to answer, the sort of the automation and all the tools and the connectivity between the systems are being worked on very rapidly and these hope to be rolled out um, within the next week or two to make sure that when we do get those really large volumes of cases that we can we can manage it and that patients have the confidence that they can self-manage as well knowing that their journey at any time should they become unwell can be moved up or down according to how they're feeling end of the day is we want most people to manage themselves <laughs> and not overload the health system or our gp uh, teams so I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, thank you, Pauline. That was, that was a great overview. There is a question on coming on the YouTube channel about what language translations. Could you try answering that on the Q and A um, uh, option? And we'll we'll move over to sure. uh, Christine McIntosh now. So Christine McIntosh is a GP and the NRHCC Primary Care Co Clinical Lead for Farnau HQ. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yes, I'm uh, one of the clinical directors shared between Rauri McCree Jansen and myself of Fano HQ, which is COVID care in the community in Auckland. And um, thank you for our presenters prior to myself, because I think you've really set the stage and actually made my job a lot easier. Um, and um, uh, really enjoyed hearing from our New South Wales colleagues um, and really feel very fortunate that here that we have had a little bit more preparation time, uh, but nevertheless, still it feels like a tsunami coming. Um, nevertheless, so Fano HQ is really describing what COVID care in the community is for us in Auckland, um, and uh, that is what it has been through the Delta outbreak. Um, and we are really heading into our Omicron, we are in our Omicron outbreak, and as Prof Blakely said, we're, we're aiming for a pure Omicron experience, which is obviously preferable. Um, I really was thinking about what this means for primary care in Auckland, and um, really acknowledging that primary care, um, my colleagues have all been going pretty hard out for two years now, and I'm sure you've felt that in Australia as well. And uh, yet it feels yet the, the next thing's coming. Um, preparation, um, you know, we've had some announcements this week about reducing the time to the booster shot. And so primary care, I'm sure at this moment, it's very much vax, vax, vax. Um, but what we really have to get into is that Omicron shift. And we have spent the last two years uh, learning how to do PPE, learning how to stream our patients and doing a whole lot of changes involved with dealing with COVID um, and really um, developed quite a lot of fear of COVID um, in our practices and in our communities. Um, 
and it is quite a shift to shift into the Omicron gear and realize that actually, yes, the numbers are going to be really big, but really reassured to hear our colleagues from New South Wales saying, yes, they're big numbers, and actually that's quite stressful in itself, but actually the majority of people are not so unwell. Um, we know the surge is coming, and this is going to need a whole of system response. So the response in Auckland prior to this has been um, really um, held up by our Māori and Pacific Regional Coordination Hubs and Whakarangaro Healthline. Uh, and we really appreciate their efforts there with that. And actually, as a result of that, I think we all had a bit of a break, which was really nice uh, over the Christmas period. Um, but the surge is coming. We really need to shift our focus to higher risk and more on well. A lot of our focus has been on managing the public health response as much as managing clinical care, and that's been made COVID very onerous to do because it's required a lot of symptom checking and managing isolation periods and release letters and things like that, which have made the system very, very onerous. But as we move into phase two and phase three, a lot of those things that had made it quite onerous actually start to go and our focus really starts to really hone in on higher risk uh, and the more unwell, uh, which I think is entirely appropriate. Um, and really just thinking about that recovery that's going to occur and actually moving into Omicron endemic, that's when we know that Omicron is going to be part of our everyday lives and actually um, we need to deal with that. We've spent a lot of time um, screening people out for COVID, but the reality is with Omicron, it's there every day and it's going to be streaming through our green streets, whether we like it or not. Um, and we're also going to have opening borders and just thinking about what that means and actually how we actually need to think beyond um, COVID and the opening of the borders and making sure that we are thinking about the other things that will come with the borders opening, like the RSV and the flu and things like that. Um, this is uh, particularly for the Auckland colleagues um, and just recognising that other people might be tuning in from around the country, but this is what Fano HQ or COVID care in the community looks for the Auckland region. And this is how we've structured ourselves. So we have a, re a Māori regional coordination hub known as Merch, Pacifica regional coordination hub known as Parch, and we also have a um, hub within NRHCC, which is around the residential facilities. So this is particularly looking at people in emergency housing and boarding houses and so forth. So more vulnerable housing situations. Um, we're now moving into the place where we're going to have to have the whole of system approach, which is entirely appropriate, where primary care, general practice, including our Māori and Pacifica providers are essential to managing COVID in the community. We're also going to have as much as possible the self-management approach, the self-serve, self-management that Pauline's just talked about. For us in Auckland region, we've also had a, um, a, a ongoing um, service from Whakarangaro who have been incredibly helpful in setting up and managing the kind of monitoring service that we needed for our Delta outbreak. And so these are the three real components to what Fano HQ looks like in our community. Um, in addition, of course, obviously we've got people who will be in hospital and we've also had hospital in the home is really the DHB extension and mainly involving people who've been in hospital and then have transitioned to the home. We also have pharmacy, and Daniel will talk about the pharmacy component shortly, but a really essential component of Fano HQ has actually been the welfare component of this. And um, it's really essential to realise that people are effective to isolate at home if they have their welfare needs met, because then they don't need to leave the house. It's also really important because actually along with that welfare comes their understanding um, and working with the Māori Pacifica providers too, is really the understanding about what it means to isolate at home and how you can do that effectively. Or obviously there's also the testing component to that and that testing will change over time and we know we're going to have the rapid antigen tests coming on board, um, but also it's likely with time that we will also have the probable cases um, and may not necessarily get tested if they're in the household bubble. 
A particular feature of the Auckland approach is we have very much had a bubble approach. You need to understand not only their individual, but where they sit within a household um, and understanding that um, households uh, may have some other needs. So you may have particularly crowded households where it's actually really important um, to be able to isolate people away. It's also really important to realise there are other considerations too and things like where the primary caregivers and the family have had to go to hospital and the children become uh, needing of caregivers and so forth. So there's been quite a lot of work going on around that as well and how we can assist people um, to uh, use extended whānau members as caregivers but um, assist them with accommodation. So just to let people know that those things are all in the pipeline. I've tried to simplify down the pathway for primary care in Auckland into this diagram and um, really just saying that primary care is to be focused around that purple lane. Um, we've got the entry into it, and this is somewhat like Pauline's one, it's just a different version of Pauline's diagram, but uh, basically a new case gets created by a positive PCR at this time, but we know that rapid antigen tests or a probable case is likely to be a feature of this in the future. We then have a risk stratification process. We have a slightly different variety of that in Auckland, which I'll describe shortly. And we also will assess welfare needs. And this is um, what uh, Louise and uh, we're, we're talking about is actually the ability to stratify your cases and really focus your care on those at higher risk. And what we're going to have is an auto allocation process into effectively into streams. We have our Māori and Pacifica hubs who are very effective in um, engaging with families and um, assessing their needs very rapidly and understanding what the needs are within the family bubble or the household bubble. And um, so we have a real equity focus around that with our Māori and Pacifica hubs, but we also know that those people living in higher depri de deprivation levels uh, also need um, a greater level of um, uh, assessment and may have more difficulties um, completing this in a digital way. And so uh, within our stratification, which I'll show you shortly, we've really prioritised those equity considerations in the way that we are doing things. And we've recognised that there is a group who are much more likely to be able to self-manage and um, really will um, be very much encouraging them to self-serve, self-manage. It is a two-step process, and it's a stratification process that's um, somewhat automatic, and then uh, the next step is uh, really assessing clinical acuity, and that clinical acuity will really let us know um, whether they have been appropriately auto-stratified and whether they need to change lanes. Um, it's important at that stage to identify people's welfare needs and we'll be able to raise welfare requests through the CCCM um, tool and uh, we'll also be able to request oximeters through that CCM tool within Auckland and that is centrally supplied. So people who are asking about oximeters in the chat, that's how you'll be able to do it in Auckland and we're getting that set up through the CCCM tool. Uh, in Auckland, we do have a clinical governance group, which is made up of a, uh, a number of primary care and DHB colleagues. Um, and this is a clinical governance group specifically for Fano HQ at this stage. And, uh, and I'm uh, pleased to report that they're very um, uh, supportive of us only applying, uh, providing oximeters to our acuity five and sixes. And I'll show you the acuity tool next slide. Um, and it's really narrowing down the supply of oximeters and, and providing them to those people who are most symptomatic and at highest need. Um, the steps in the pathway that follow that is really um, the COVID case care and their bubble care. And just being aware of other people in the bubble, it's not as intense as it previously was. And we really want the focus to be on those who are most unwell. And we know that the case release and the bubble isolation um, uh, will change in those phase and fa phase two and phase three. Um, we are still sorting out exactly what the after hours and weekends, we're expecting the inbound calls, so that's when patients are making calls because they need help, will be managed by Whakarangaro Healthline. Um, and that's why it's critically important when we're doing COVID care that we're using what is essentially that care, shared care record through the CCM that you can access via your health link tab in your practice management system. 
um, with respect to the outbound calls, that is actually routine calls to those people you're most concerned about um, out of hours. We're still uh, working on the, um, the uh, solutions around that one for primary care in Auckland. This is the um, stratification process. Um, Pauline talked about the Ministry of Health stratification process being on age, ethnicity and VAC status. Um, colleagues in Auckland have been uh, using um, the Delta data, the Delta outbreak data to do a risk of hospitalisation. And that has uh, additional factors included, in, including comorbidities, um, which has allowed us in Auckland region to be able to um, develop the risk of hospitalisation tool and we have um, are now able to apply that to our new cases um, via a click dashboard report, which will allow our hubs to be able to prioritise people and stratify them and essentially an A to D stratification. And that's based on priority of, of uh, making sure that we make contact with people with A's being our most concerning because they are at higher risk and have higher equity needs um, and are not enrolled with the GP. Um, through to those who are um, having lower welfare needs and a low risk stratification and are much more um, likely and actually um, we are less concerned about and will be keen on them self-serving and self-managing. And we have levels in between that so that as the numbers go up, we are able to make choices about how each of those is managed, if that makes sense to everybody. So as I said, that's just the first step in the process. The second step is what happens next. And that's about the um, assessing the clinical risk of the social needs. And that's done through the clinical acuity tool, which is on the health pathways. Um, and assessing whether the person is severely unwell and needs hospital, whether they've got moderate symptoms or mild symptoms. Christine, this is you're going to wrap up soon. We're just running short of time. That's okay, I can wrap up soon. So this is the clinical acuity tool and you'll find it on the health pathways as they're getting updated. And this is my final slide. So really just thinking about Auckland preparing for um, in primary care. Um, important, I think everyone's covered a lot of these things. Um, use your health pathways, keep looking at the health pathways. They will get adjusted as they need to as this um, evolves. Um, get access and know how to use your CCCM and almost all practices in Auckland will now have ability to see cases as they come through. Um, read your medins messages, that's the way we communicate in Auckland out to primary care and let you know what you need to know next. Um, also I'd like to um, say that we are now working on having facilitated peer COVID care webinars. That's where we have experts, including some that are on this um, webinar tonight, really to talk through case care and really to support primary care to upskill about how to manage COVID. And just really important that we let patients know what they are to expect. And there are local and national communications planned. Um, on the right, you can see the Fano HQ short guide to what to do at home. Uh, we have a Fano HQ website, which um, is information for patients and also remembering to use Health Navigator. And also as a practice, um, really be proactive and send out information to your patients. I received a magnificent uh, one from, the, um, from my GP practice uh, the other day. Um, not where I work, where I go to get my own care. Um, and I thought that that was fantastic and really proactive of them. That's it from me. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Christine. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Daniel Calder. Uh, he's a GP uh, and clinical director of East Health Trust PHO. Daniel. Tana koutou katoa. I uh, will do a short segment, uh, just in terms of getting your workplaces uh, geared up and ready for Omicron. But I think that the first point I would make is that we're all in a really privileged position here in New Zealand that we've had so few cases of COVID and that's really thanks to the efforts of all of you that are on this call. You've uh, been handling this superbly to date. And the fact that we've got so many people vaccinated means that we're in a much better position than we would have been otherwise. Now, a lot of what I'm saying today is really just trying to remind you that what you've done up until now is to an extent what you'll also be doing for Omicron. So it's not all new. Um, if you think around your, uh, oh, 
If you think around your screening and streaming, um, screening is something that we do for every patient every time. So you want to have a consistent script for it. I would recommend using the ones that are on the health pathways, but you do this on your patient portal. You do it when patients call. You do it when they come in as a walk-in. That's your opportunity to then split them into your green and red stream. Numbers may go up quite a lot. When we are further down in the Omicron experience, you might have a higher volume that needs to go through the red stream, but it doesn't mean that we stop streaming. Now, the concept of streaming, it is no longer going to be an absolute disaster if you get a COVID positive patient that comes through the green stream. We have to live with that because a lot of people will be asymptomatic or so mild that it's not identified. But the streaming is still worthwhile because you're reducing the bulk of COVID positive patients that are mingling with other more vulnerable patients. And it's really about protecting the patients rather than the staff at this point. You're all triple vaccinated. We have to trust that the vaccine is going to keep us safe. Not only are we triple vaccinated, we're now dealing with a milder version of COVID. In terms of PPE, I'm not going to go into the details there, but it really, to a large extent, remains the same as what you're doing now. The key difference will be to encourage patients to wear a surgical face mask rather than some of the soft sort of uh, homemade bandanas, etc., that they've been wearing. In terms of ventilation, I know there's a lot of interest around that. If we look overseas, most of our GP colleagues, um, they have been continuing to work out of their existing buildings. They have not had retrofitted um, ventilation systems. My recommendation is that you look at where you've got the best ventilation and think about sticking your red stream there. But by and large, we expect people to keep seeing patients without necessarily changing all of the ventilation around. In some cases, you may need to do it outdoors. You can think about HEPA filtration units, uh, but it's not um, a, a must, I would say. Now, in terms of how I see this pan out over the next weeks and months, I think we really have to look at what is our role as primary care, so GPs, nurses, pharmacists, what is it that we do? Well, we've got really trusted relationships with our patients. Politicians would love having the sort of ratings that we get. Um, if you think about what we can do here, we can take our patients through this experience. Many of them are afraid and most of them will not become very unwell, but they need our support. And as Christine said, be proactive, send things out. That can be on your websites, it can be mail outs, and it can be even starting the discussion in your regular consults, just asking people if they're prepared for COVID. We want you to keep going with chronic disease management as long as possible. So we don't want to turn things off prematurely. I also want to make the point that the call to action in the very beginning of the pandemic, where we all heard switch over all of your in-person consults to telehealth, that is no longer the case. We want to now be available both in person and with telehealth offerings. For the vast majority of COVID consults, you can handle that over the phone or video. But for many of our other patients that are coming in with non-COVID related issues, they actually need still to be seen in person. And we've already got a lag. We've got lots of people that um, have not come in that we need to still be seeing. As we move through the um, increased volumes of cases, you do need to carve out sufficient time in the template for those acute patients. The idea here is really to titrate up the blocked appointments so you have more held appointments for acute demand. That is something that we're doing to support and protect our urgent care colleagues and ED. There will, of course, be a limit to how many we can see, but try to set aside some for the acute presentations. And then my last point is really around resilience. And I think there's a strong connection between personal resilience 
and business continuity and keeping the clinics open. So it starts with ourselves. You need to make sure that you're covering all the basics, but also look after your staff and colleagues. It's so easy to forget this when we get busy. Business continuity plans, yeah, it's a good idea to update them, but really think through practically, what will you do if 25%, 30% of your colleagues are not able to come into the clinic? What does that mean? What would we practically do? And remember, there is a difference here. If you've got colleagues that are um, standing down because of being a close contact or they are unwell, but really a very mild um, case of feeling almost like a cold, they can probably do some telehealth consults. That's absolutely fine. But if one of your colleagues is feeling rotten, feeling really unwell, they shouldn't be consulting and we need to protect them and they need to essentially have proper sick leave. And then my last uh, plea here would just be to ask every single one of you to look into what regional data sharing systems have you got. So in Auckland, we've got your health summary. Other regions have their own system, such as Health One in the South Island. This is a really important step because if your clinic becomes completely overwhelmed with the number of people that are unable to work and you need support from a friendly practice, the way that would most efficiently be done is through these regional data sharing systems. So if you haven't yet signed up to your health summary in the Metro Auckland region or your equivalent, please contact your PHO to get on board with that. Thank you. The point I think you take home there, uh, Daniel, is trust the vaccine. Absolutely. And I think we need to stop being afraid of having COVID positive patients coming into a clinic. I think uh, we will all be seeing COVID positive patients, uh, but we will remain well, I think. So Dean Winard is a public health physician uh, at Counties Manukau and NRHCC. Thanks, Bruce, and uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, just really picking up on some of the points that Daniel was making at the end about what if many of your colleagues were off because they had COVID. We know that the international experience um, with Omicron highlights that maintaining healthcare staffing at safe levels is challenging when there's widespread community transmission. And we do know that that's a concern for many in primary care. So anticipating that situation, guidance has actually been developed to support the continuity of critical health care when the service provision will be at risk of compromise because of staff absences, because of infection or exposure. Um, so it covers the things that can be altered in terms of availability, namely the work to return to work after COVID infection and working post a COVID exposure. Um, so this guidance, and, and I'm just literally talking for a couple of minutes about it uh, and going to point you to where it is. The guidance is now up on the Ministry of Health website so that you can familiarise yourself with it. It's sitting alongside the current healthcare worker exposure management guidance and the appendices and templates um, that support the implementation of that in primary care. And some of you may be more familiar with that than others because you've had to use it already. Um, for those in Auckland um, who get the Medins, this document was the one that was actually linked in the Medins that went out today. So we're not going to talk about the detail, just really wanting to highlight that applying this guidance is actually about making pragmatic decisions. It is about balancing a transmission risk in the context of a community transmission with our ability to develop safe healthcare. It doesn't mean that every healthcare worker automatically comes back to work earlier than they would if they weren't a critical healthcare worker. Uh, it, it is, a, if they weren't a healthcare worker, it's about the criticality of the workforce and the service. We do know that often busy clinical leaders and managers want to get straight, you know, to the guts of the document. So you go and you look for some bullet points and you look for a table that tells you exactly what to do. Just really want to say, in looking at this document, it's really important to read the introduction. The framing and the context are really important for how the document and the guidance is to be used. Um, and the details of implementing this are a work in progress. So for example, you'll see when you have a look at it, it requires access to rat testing to implement. And we know that you know working that out across the sector it is still currently a work in progress. Um, it is also important, um, you know, when we're talking about doing the team preparation stuff, 
how this is used and the situation in, in which it's used um, are going to need to be communicated really well with staff. And there are some FAQs that are being developed to support that. But again, as part of the preparation that Daniel and others have been talking about, this is something to be talked about together. So it's really pointing you to it being there. Feedback is welcome to make it fit for purpose. Um, so feel free to, as you have a read and think about it, think about how it, what it might mean in practice in your situation if you were going to be called on to be applying it. Um, we're working really closely with the ministry on this, so you can send feedback to NOHCC and then we can wrap that into the ministry process as we continue to have this ready. Um, so we'll send the email out with the link for the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, June. Um, our next speaker is Daniel Sai. He's the program manager for community pharmacy at NRHCC. Daniel. Hi everyone, I um, hope you can all see the um, slide here and um, just wanted to, I guess, provide an update to all the um, health providers in our area that community pharmacies uh, will maintain and operate um, their services. Uh, it just might look slightly different. Um, so as we see the numbers of cases go up, there will be uh, more and more people requiring to isolate at home. Um, and then uh, what the funding arrangement will allow is to support pharmacies to be able to fulfill um, home deliveries and reimbursement of prescription co-payments um, so that we can keep those patients safe at home. Um, the other feature of the pharmacy service is to ensure that there is ability for medicine management and teleconsult. And that is really to allow pharmacists to um, have an assessment with the patient, discuss their medication needs, and figure out exactly what this patient might need um, in terms of repeat prescriptions or a new request from the GP for a new script, um, or it could be things like self-management and the supply of um, over-the-counter uh, medicine to, to relieve fever, pain, and, and dehydration. Um, and then the last point I wanted uh, touch on is just around some of the critical services that pharmacies already offer, um, like opioid substitution therapy or anticoagulation management services, where it may still need to continue, you know, when patients are isolating at home. Um, so there will be pharmacies available who will be able to um, continue doing that um, and, and, you know, make arrangements uh, to, to maintain continuity of supply. Um, so really, you know, wanted to touch on the services that pharmacies will be offering in relation to COVID positive patients. Um, and then we will have a list of pharmacies uh, who are supporting Final HQ listed on HealthPoint so that uh, patients, um, GPs, hospital teams, Whakaronga Row, um, you know, Merch and Parch are all familiar with what's available around their region and around where the patients live. Um, and if you have any queries, feel free to use the um, email address and we'll try to answer um, promptly as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Daniel. And our final speaker is uh, Hon uh, Honorary Professor Nikki Turner in our department, uh, also the director of IMAC. And she's gonna talk about the immunization of five to 11 year olds booster doses and what's next for vaccines. Nikki. Kia ora koutou, and I'm aware that I'm at the end of a very long session and we're running a bit late. So I will um, whip through some of these slides a bit fast, which you'll probably all be relieved about. Um, but also you'll have the slides available for later. This is my cat, Eric, who helped me put the presentation together just to make the evening a lot happier. Um, so look, firstly, I think my colleagues have already touched on the disease Omicron. And I think the important difference here with Omicron, people have already reflected on it, is a huge amount of asymptomatic. So we're going to expect a lot of asymptomatic carriage. We know that hospitalization, emergency care, much lower rates than Delta, but the numbers are higher. So it's really a numbers game. So we're going to see a lot. And I think the other interesting thing, and it was touched on very nicely, is once you get the exponential increase in numbers anywhere around the world, as you go into that exponential increase, your rates peak at around three to five 
week. So it's pretty rapid through this wave. So it can reassure us that we will come out the other side. This is the classic looking curve. Many of you will have seen this from the UK and many other countries show it very similar. Now, I think this is the vaccine side of it that is really useful to know. Do vaccines work and why are we pushing them? So the little black squares um, are Delta and the little white ones are Omicron. And you can see for symptomatic infection from two doses, Delta is way more effective than Omicron. You get this huge drop off and then you get a boost, quite a significant boost with the um, booster dose. Now, what's important is we're after severe disease, not symptomatic. And if you look at the response to a booster, this is the Pfizer booster here. If you look at the response to a booster, you can see that you get extremely high protection against severe disease. We are not anywhere near elimination or worrying about mild disease. We're in the phase now of protecting our people against hospitalization and death. To look at it in a different way, this is data looking at a combination of the Moderna, the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccine. And actually the Pfizer alone is acting higher than this, but you can see vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization to one dose, to two doses, to two doses dropping off by six months. And then when you give your booster, you get a real quick kick in. Now, what we haven't got yet is the longevity of action to a booster. So these are, these are data which is just two weeks after the booster. Um, so just a quick summary of booster doses and why we're using them is two dose vaccine effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine we're using for symptomatic disease to the Omicron variant drops to about 60% and under 20% by six months. Add in the booster and you're picking up to about 50% against symptomatic disease. However, when you look at hospitalization, two doses plus a booster, you're way up there with much higher protection. Um, now, I just chucked this slide in out of interest. There's been a lot of discussion about the two different Omicron variants, just to say that they're both looking fairly similar from a vaccine point of view, that vaccinations are still standing up well against severe disease to the BA two variant as well as BA1. And this is Eric, who's still very confused. So I hope a few of you aren't going right in the pantry at this point. So key points around Omicron and boosters, two doses alone offer modest and short-term protection, but a lot better for severe disease. Now, what I haven't shown you is I've just lumped everybody in together, but two doses for younger people is still highly effective and they get a longer, more durable immunity. So we do not need to rush out and offer boosters lock, stock and barrel to younger people. This is about people of more mature years, such as myself and many of us on this call and people with comorbidity. So yes, we're offering boosters for 18 years and plus, but the important ages are really 50 years and up and probably 40 years and up for Māori and Pacifica. A booster dose does improve protection against symptomatic disease. We will still get a lot of asymptomatic disease and a lot of transmission. So we're not gonna knock off transmission very much, only a little bit, but it does provide excellent protection against severe disease. And we've got some recent Ontario data showing um, that the Pfizer booster is well over 90, 98, 99% effective to severe disease. So it's way up there. Why have we gone for shorter intervals? Well, it's a trade-off. The shorter interval, we know they work because we've got the UK data. The UK is using the shorter booster interval and we know that you do get that good upswing. You get a good antibody response and it works. As a vaccinology background, I would much prefer a longer interval. You tend to get a better immunological and probably more durable response, but we are going to get a good response even with shorter. So it was a trade-off because we know that we're going to have a surge over about three, three, four months, and we get the best protected population through that time. And remembering the focus of vaccinations now is on reduction of severe disease. The only other point about boosters is this obsession with antibodies. It is not just about antibodies, that it's really clear, and this is the reason there's good protection against severe disease, you can get antibody waning, but you've still got cellular memory. So for those of us who had our boosters late last year, you know, we might start to see some antibody waning, but we'll still have good cellular memory. Rapidly moving on to kids and why are we vaccinating against kids? As we all know, um, children, particularly school-aged children, have much lower risk of severe disease with COVID. 
It depends which data you want to read. We've been looking closely at the Australian data, somewhere between one to 5% hospitalized. Many of those are hospitalized for social reasons. Sometimes it's because their parents are sick. Um, but hospitalization rates are way higher for kids with comorbidity. And in the New Zealand population, eight to 9% of our kids have got comorbidity and nearly up to 10% have got significant obesity, which is also highly associated. So while admissions can be brief and can be for social reasons, if you do end up in hospital, somewhere between two and 15% will end up in intensive care. Now, it doesn't seem like worth a vaccine, but the absolute numbers are huge. As you know, from around the world, large amounts of our kids are gonna be affected. So this is more an absolute numbers game and a protection of those kids who are particularly at higher risk. Um, there's an, an, a disease that many of us have been unaware of called pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And that does affect about one in 3000 kids. And it tends to peak like around the age of nine or 10. So when you're getting big numbers, we're gonna see this condition. So that is significant. Long COVID is seen in kids. It's less frequent, but it definitely is seen in kids and it can affect learning. It can give them fuzzy brains and headaches appears to affect girls more and probably teenagers more. So you can see that deaths do occur. There's some US data there showing that COVID deaths last year, no, sorry, in 2020, were among um, the top 10 leading deaths for this age uh, and very similar or slightly higher than other BPDs, such as rotavirus, virus, or rubella, and slightly lower than influenza. So that sort of it certainly puts it in the ballpark of being a reasonable vaccine um, to use um, for this particular disease. Now, this is, I find this a really interesting slide. This is looking at all the studies, looking at the infection fatality from COVID in the red versus influenza in the blue. And if you're looking at the kids end of it, you can see that you're almost equipoise up to the age of 10 between um, the effect on our kids from influenza severe influenza versus severe COVID. So I think there's an argument to be made for protecting our kids against COVID and influenza if you look at this younger age group. And then you can see the rates for COVID really take off at that age group. But I mean, it does highlight again and again that we've underestimated the damage from flu. These are some numbers in New Zealand. These were from a Delta outbreak. So we don't have caught as yet have numbers of any significant amount from Omicron. I just leave a table of the risk factors. Now, the reason for the risk factors for children um, who might be at high risk of severe COVID is we're offering a two dose program eight weeks apart. We're keen to try and keep the eight week gap if we can. Most kids will get good protection we're expecting after one dose. So we don't consider there's a reason to rush into a second dose. However, the group of kids there think about and think about hard. And um, along with that, remembering this pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which is seen two to six weeks following infection, regardless of whether it's asymptomatic or not. So this is a syndrome that um, us in general practice will be unaware of. Just think about this in kids, a high fever, a rash, a conjunctivitis, something that could look like anything really. So just be aware of the syndrome that we haven't really focused on before and really think about why we're we focusing on kids. There are significant health equity considerations here. Um, Māori and Pacifica kids in general have disport disproportionately much higher burden of disease for respiratory illnesses. So these are the kids who are gonna suffer along with the fact that many of them have comorbidities as well. And I'm particularly concerned about the rates of obesity, you know, uh, particularly in some of our Pacific communities. So these kids, a lot of them are at higher risk and, and really need protection with vaccination. So summary, why do we wanna vaccinate kids? Well, firstly, with the Omicron sweeping through, most of them are likely to be exposed at some stage. Symptoms are often mild. Um, those are a list of the symptoms maybe around one in a hundred will require hospitalization. Intensive care is rare, but there are some long-term consequences um, and the potential for long COVID, although rarer than adults. I would highlight to all our people in our community that there's a strong push that children are not and will not be subject to vaccine pass requirements or school exclusion. So this is not a must. This is a, we wanna support our kids to be vaccinated. Vaccine benefits, I think we're gonna run out of time. So I just leave this with people. There is no data on the effectiveness of a single dose, but we do have data on the effectiveness of a single dose in teenagers and young adults. And we would expect it to be fairly similar. So 
remembering that we're trying to prevent severe disease, not mild disease. So a single dose for our kids, I think is well worth going for. The boosters, really more important for our older people and our comorbidities, but getting a single dose into the kids is gonna help. Um, so why would we vaccinate children against COVID? I've reflected that it's a public health issue. Um, it's really severe or fatal, but it's important for kids with comorbidities for Māori and Pacifica kids. Um, there is a weaker argument around transmitting that we are going, not going to reduce the incidence of transmission much with vaccination. So I wouldn't overrate that argument, but it is potentially possible. You'll certainly, if you have less symptomatic, then your transmission is less. So that's very useful. The more you can bump off symptomatic disease and turn it into milder asymptomatic, you'll certainly reduce your transmission. So I just want to finish up with common questions that are coming along at the moment. So the lack of clarity as to why we're using boosters. I think, I hope this is really clear to all of us that we are trying to reduce severe disease across our community. So boosters, yes, but really, really focus on high risk groups. And I'm finding it alarming when I looked at the data recently to realize that our elderly Pacifica population over 65, something like 6.8% of them still haven't had their primary course. We, we've done really well with our, our Māori um, over 65s, only 1% have not had their primary course. So, you know, the younger Pacifica are coming forward, but we need to find our older Pacifica people. So just remembering who's missing out and who needs boosters at this point in time, that's our urgent focus. Is it a problem moving to three months? No, it's not ideal. I would have preferred a longer gap, but it will still work at three months and we're gonna get through this Omicron surge. After that, I suspect for most of our population, we're gonna get wild boosting after that. So we're not going to need boosters again and again and again. Although potentially we may well need boosters again and again for high risk people. I personally would not be expecting to see us repeatedly using boosters across the whole population. I would expect that New Zealand, after all this vaccination effort, will have a reasonably high level of immunity from vaccination. And we've already got data coming in to show that um, disease on top of vaccination gives you good extra boosting of your immunity. I've mentioned children in the eight week gap. We prefer to stick to eight week gap for most children, but children who are at higher risk, you can vaccinate them from three weeks after the first dose. Now, the other thing that comes up is off-label usage. There's still quite a few quirks around that people have had different schedules or we may feel there's a need. And for example, um, high risk um, young people from 12 to 17 um, with significant comorbidities, you know, people who may be um, on renal dialysis or on significantly immuno um, compromising drugs such as rheumatoid, these, these young people may benefit from a booster. It's a very small group um, and we can offer off-label situations like that, but with caution, we're getting flooded with a lot of questions about people with mild comorbidities wanting their 17 and a half year olds to race into boosters now, whereas really healthy young people do well with the primary course, reassure people that they will not get severe disease unless they've got significant comorbidities. This I thought was my final slide, was a very interesting slide that's just come out of the WHO. Thinking forward, we're gonna get through this um, Omicron surge in a few months. What are we looking towards? Well, they were looking at three different scenarios. The first one is it becomes another endemic coronavirus that we get enough immunity. We then end up getting coronaviruses regularly and they build upon our immunity and eventually it becomes mild. The second scenario, and it's beginning to look a bit like that, is it begins to start a respiratory pattern a bit like flu that we are seeing in countries with high levels of community immunity now. So they've either got it from wild disease or vaccine or both, but they're beginning to fall into the pattern of seeing severe disease in the very young and the very old. Um, so you're starting to see quite an upsurge of disease in, in kids under six months and very elderly, which is much more like a flu pattern. And we may start to see it falling like that. The other potential, of course, is, is we may just get other variants and they, they evade the immunity we've all carefully, painstakingly developed. So that's the most gloomy scenario, is the, the, the bloody thing decides to mutate again and you get another pandemic. So I'm voting for scenario two or some blend between one or two myself. And that is the end of going through the wave over the next three or four months. That's what we're all going to feel like. So kia ora koutou to you all. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you, Eric.
Now this can ask the panel, I see got quite a few questions. But I can answer the one, it was Richard was asking about what we were using for the Fano HQ dashboard and it's click is in Q-L-I-K, which is our regional um, visualizations of our data for COVID. Which probably um, doesn't mean much to most people, but that's fine. That's okay. how we use, it's our intelligence that we use for planning and intelligence at um, Northern Region Good. Coordination Centre. It's got a question for Tim, just about long COVID after Omicron. Tim, is there any information? Do we have enough information yet on that? Or it, too early to tell, uh, by definition, I guess, given that it's only Omicron's only been <laughs> kicking around since late November. Um, but I guess there's plausible reasons to believe that it might be less associated with long. COVID on the basis of the tropism, the upper respiratory airway and less able to get into sneaky other bits of the body, um, we think. But yeah, watch this space. Okay, anybody else got something burning from um, the questions? Yep. Bruce, um, it's Wally oh, here. And, yep. um, the um, the yeah, number of questions about, um, you know, what PPE we're wearing and whether you go the green stream or the red stream or the orange stream, um, we only have one stream, and that's um, everybody's infectious until proven otherwise stream. Um, that's kind of the prevalence that we have at the moment. Um, as GPs, um, look, we are, we're seeing face-to-face -face patients. Um, not, not We're screening respiratory out, and we're avoiding seeing respiratory uh, patients with respiratory symptoms as much as we can. When we do, it's full-on PPE. Um, or we try and get a rapid antigen or, or a PCR test that shows that the patient doesn't have COVID before they come in here, um, if they have respiratory symptoms. For all other patients that don't have respiratory symptoms and are screened that way, um, they're welcome to come. We try and minimise contact in the waiting room. We try and sit them outside um, uh, as much as possible. But we're seeing them because they have to be seen because they, they need us. But we're wearing N95 and eye protection goggles um, for every single patient, every single patient, um, uh, because that's the only way that we can be not deemed at close contact. Otherwise, if we're spending more than half an hour with them in the room, we're going to, or 15 minutes or so, we're going to be deemed at close contact and we've taken out. So, uh, it's, and all patients in coming to practices in New South Wales uh, must wear a surgical mask, like they must. We're just handing them out if they don't come in. And so, um, uh, that's the kind of sort of it, the prevalence is so high that we're just assuming everybody's red. <laughs> okay. Uh, Stuart, just put your hand up if you've got a question. Stuart, you got a question? Not a question, just to advertise the ongoing webinars that we will be organising. Yep. So feel free to feedback to um, myself. I'm usually at the bottom of most Medin's messages or to Bruce or anyone that you see on the screen in terms of the. Um, I guess the program and, and what you want covered. And um, I'm mindful that there are a number of questions still unanswered this evening, but I think we'll work our way through them in the next few weeks. We're looking at at least one or two webinars a week. If you don't get to all of them, don't worry. Um, we realize you're busy, um, but we will be um, working to provide you as much, with as much information as possible. And don't forget Health Pathways. Doreen, you've got a comment? Maybe we could close with you. Sure, I was just wanting to pick up on um, Waleed's um, comments about the PPE. I'm certainly not the expert, but I provide support for our clinical tag up here. And I think one of the things, again, learning from other people's experience, we've been able to manage quite a lot of that um, concern about exposure and using PPE to prevent exposure by actually dealing with how we categorize exposure and being able to you know, keep people working. So actually the advice here isn't a about to change to be in 95s for everything because we're dealing with it by a different route and we've had a lot of support from secondary care to, to do that route as well. You know, look, at it, I agree. And I think, I mean, I'm not saying that we're forced to wear in 95, it's just the, um, the, the it's, it's a matrix and I'm sure you've got the same yeah. similar matrix and most exposures will be deemed not um, critical, certainly not close, um, but um, some are. And so we've what we've decided is that we'll wear PPE for all patients. Um, and at a minimum, at a minimum, a surgical mask and eye protection, pretty much. Yeah. Mm. So, have any of the panelists got a burning question that they can see that, that we haven't answered? As Stuart says, we will be having more of these things. So, as we start to meet these patients, we will start having different questions. Of course, um, Pauline, you've got a, a comment. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so I just I found the question. Uh, there was a couple of questions there around um, people who are unenrolled or people who are sort of not really accessing care through the normal routes. Um, if they have had a test, the fact that they're not enrolled will be then flagged in the system. Um, and, and there might be a variety of ways that that person needs to be engaged with, and it could involve, um, you know, the, the local community providers or EB providers to actually to, to reach out to them. So I, I guess it's a plug as well to, to sort of, if you don't know what's happening in your region, you probably really good time to find out via your colleagues or your PHO or DHB, what is happening in your COVID hub regionally, how do you fit in and what support's available um, and also what support you can provide. So it's that really sort of locally led collaborative coordination. But the people who are unenrolled or who aren't accessing services at the moment, we actually might be able to pick them up. So that'll be great. Okay, well, I'm just gonna thank the panel, particularly our Australian um, counterparts for giving us a. Uh, a view of the future. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, for all your expertise and being willing to come and help primary care. And uh, so I look forward to seeing some of you, all of you over the next uh, many weeks, because uh, Stuart's uh, lining up uh, any uh, some more webinars. Stuart, do you want to say any final words or should we over and out here? No, just to reiterate your thanks to the panel, particularly our Australian cousins. Yep, yep. Okay, everybody, good night and thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you to the audience. Okay, bye.